It's a bit loose, eh? But it's okay. Can I ask everyone to get seated, please? So we are now getting started. I can see some people standing somewhere talking. Hello. So we are now moving to the last uh, uh, group reporting. And before we do that, I am going to make one uh, quick announcement. My name is Emmanuel Mutisia. I am with the African Development Bank, Education and Skills Development Division. The announcement is that all ministers, all honorable ministers are requested to provide their flight details for de departure to the protocol desks at the back of the plenary room. Don't forget to provide your flight uh, details. And now to move to the summaries, I'm going to request the groups A, B, C, D, the rapporteurs of each group, uh, to come to the stage uh, to re prepare for the reporting uh, session. And uh, I'm also going to ask uh, I think it's Olivia Olivia Sagna to join the group at the front here. So all the rapporteurs, please. Group A. B, C, and D. I'm going to give each one of you eight minutes to give the summaries of the outcomes of your discussions. Can we start with group A? Okay, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> All right, I am going to make uh, a summary of the deliberations for Group A, which focused on how to strike the right balance in financing different levels of the education system. There was a lot of debate. We actually raised more questions than provided answers to that discussion because in reality, it's actually very challenging to spread spending sensibly across all the levels of the education system. Sometimes it's not easy. And the first part of the discussion was actually spent on outlining some of the challenges the countries have had. And a good example was given of even here in South Africa, how the youth at the universities have been having many strikes time and again because funding at the university has been a challenge and even in tertiary education has been a challenge. And the other challenge that was actually raised even as we wanted to seek solutions was that current funding is actually catering to the middle class Whereas public spending on education should be inclusive, should take care of 
all the children. Many of the children on the lower cadres are actually missing out. And again, they gave the example of South Africa, which is having that challenge. So one of the key questions that was asked was, do we even know where we are getting money from to spend on education? And do we know what we are spending that money on? Why were these questions asked? It's because the teams actually realized that we do not have credible statistics that speak to how much is actually going into education, how much is available. And on the panel, we had uh, a representation from the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. He gave examples of only 20 countries having provided statistics that is actually being used what is happening to the other countries, and what does that mean? If countries are not providing statistics, how then can you plan when you don't have credible statistics? So the beginning point then means that really the statistics are not informative enough, and something must be done about that. We must begin to have credible data to make informed decisions on financing education. I think that's a beginning point. Now, the other key issues on statistics that was on, on the data is that the data systems across the different levels of education may not be integrated. So for example, in early childhood education, cross-referencing with basic education, cross-referencing with TVET and universities. I think from the team, they say that really needs to, to happen. And then of course, they, they also recommended that policies surrounding financing must be robust enough so that they are actually helping in channeling and disaggregating this financing to the different sectors of the education. One of the issues that was pointed out in the data uh, section of the discussion was in relation to, for example, the 100% transition. It is a noble idea that the students are transitioning from primary school to secondary school and the policy is in place for 100%. But are we thinking around the financing of that and the implication for secondary school? The other key thing that was very big in the discussion, and I think it took the bulk of the discussion, was on equity. The issue of the, research, the, the, issue of the financing actually catering to all the students. And a question, a valid question was asked. What is happening to the out of school population? Do we know how many children are out of school? They have not attended secondary school. Who is financing these children? Should they be financed? Or we should ignore them and focus on the mainstream? And what does that mean for those children in terms of national development? What does it mean for women? What does it mean for girls? So that was uh, an issue we we, we problematized in, in, the, in the session as well. Then the other issue was on the current spending on education, which they said in many contexts is less than 4% of the GDP. Is that enough? Can we not find innovative ways of increasing our own revenue bases? Then of course somebody pointed out that Singapore only has 3.2% of GDP on education, what is it that they are doing differently to make their system work? And whereas in our context, we may have up to 5% of the GDP, what's the difference? And what should be done to improve that? So as I said, we raised more questions than actually provided answers. And so we said, really, we require affirmative action in education spending because if you say, for example, and they gave the example of Ghana, 
Ghana has put in place free secondary education. Do all the parents really need to, I mean, all the children need to benefit from that? And there are other children from well-off families who really don't need that free secondary education. Can we not then channel those resources to the needy cases? What are the mechanisms we need to put in place to make sure that the children who are actually needy, the poor of the poor, are benefiting from those kinds of uh, systems? So even when we think about the policy, why, how much percentage, percentage will go to, these, uh, to the girls and, 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 uh, and women? Then we also talked about the importance of harnessing the potential of our tax bases. What can we do to make sure that our tax bases are actually increasing? And of course, within the budgetary allocations, giving priority to human capital development over other things. And it's critical. Yes, we know that the other things, the infrastructure matters, but where you have meager resources, where would you rather put those resources? So I'll be, I'll be giving more attention to the human capital development. The other issue that was raised was the government actually being able to create an enabling environment so that private sector can engage and putting in place policies that actually support and, and, and also outline how private sector can invest in education and, and get uh, returns on, on their investment. The other thing that was uh, raised in terms of um, a, a solution was actually to strengthen the accountability systems, putting in place a tracking system of the financing in education, ensuring that budgetary allocations are being tracked across the system. I know some countries have what they call the IFMIS, could that be one of the options? And how foolproof is that if me system? And also increasing, uh, I have just two points, increasing the culture of evidence and using evidence to make better decisions. And of course, looking at best practice that are happening internationally and borrowing that and integrating it within our own systems. And lastly, being able to collaborate. What we are doing in this room today being able to exchange ideas on how we are doing it in the various countries would be the way to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, we move to Group B. Good evening. Well, uh, my group, uh, we were given the task to like to understand how can we finance secondary education in a way that targets the poorest. <clears throat> and many ideas came along, but the first one was to bring, on, bring in all the stakeholders so that they can be able to help and build with infrastructure. For example, bringing in the communities to help with building the infrastructure of the schools. And introducing feeding programs within the schools. And those feeding programs would be run by parents and churches. And uh, the next one was schools should conduct production. And uh, the minister gave us an example of farming where schools by where schools where schools can do farming. And the next one was to allocate how expendi expenditure is used in education. There was another idea where, which came along, which was harmonizing salaries of teachers and uh, fixing school fees according to the pr province's commodities that will determine the school fees that should be paid. And uh, classifying families as per income so that the poorest can be at, of advantage. And the country's commodities should contribute a percentage in secondary education. And NGOs should provide where the government cannot. 
uh, they also need to identify ways to improve cost efficiency and effectiveness within education subsectors. And they need to improve targeting of spending for secondary age education towards the most marginalized, including the non-formal education. And we have to consider how education expenditure is allocated across education levels. And the importance to link the social protection programs more effectively this we have seen in a few of our programs across the region, example, Kanya in Tanzania. Public secondary school, public secondary in good schools, competitive, politicized and patronized by the rich to the exclusion of the poor, reading public funding of private education, of private education of good quality. And uh, that's all. That's all I could give. I could give. Thank you very much. Collapse for you, please. Thank you, Group B. Now we go to Group C. Okay, so uh, our group topic for discussion was what system level efficiencies might help open fiscal space to finance secondary education. So uh, we looked at it from the overview of um, the current efficiency of the current systems in place. How do we optimize and maximize inputs and outputs? And so for the current systems we have in place, being it in infrastructure, being it in curriculum, how do we ensure we use them to the maximum before we even look at spending another additional cost for other new developments? Then it was interesting to note um, Africa is the highest tax rate continent in the world. And so then if we want to focus on increasing our tax base, we need to look at that again. S themes out of our discussion went in the, in the areas of first, we need to increase, that is increase of domestic revenue. And that means there should be a percentage increase of our GDPs to education, maximum 6% will do for us if we do that. That is the best sustainable way to increase finance in our education in many parts of Africa. Um, the next thing is efficiency gains, efficiency gains and cost savings. And so that is, that is also a way for us to look at it when it comes to um, creating financial measures and vehicles in this space. And so what we're looking at is um, efficiency gains increase of teacher cost, reduction of learning materials and also there are times we go ahead too early to develop a lot of interesting new curriculums and that comes with a lot of cost for us. So how do we maximize and save cost in that place? Then there is the issue of cost transferring and so then I'm managing contributions from NGOs. We need to open our net wide, get a lot of other stakeholders such as NGOs to help them with their finances and also make sure we make finances, we, we gain cash from what they do to help finance our educational initiatives. Then the major issue for us, which was key, was on the engagement of private sector. It was interesting to note Orange and Burkina Faso is doing a lot with schools. Safaricom and others in Kenya are also doing a lot. Um, private sector coming in here will help us because they, they will help develop a lot of centers. But the beauty of getting private sector in here is also to make sure you create a system to a system to incentivize them and that is the look of tax rebates to make sure they come in and that is the exchange they get when they do that. Big issue for us is um, the need to increase and that is my concluding point. Um, that is the, the, the need to increase budget on education if we really want to see different results on our continent with education. So um, for government, that is our biggest plea for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause for him. Thank you. And lastly, Group uh, D. Thank you very much. Uh, so Group D discussed uh, perspectives of youth engagement on secondary, secondary reform. Uh, we had really rich conversations, actually. Um, before we started the session, a, a question was asked, which I want to pose to people in the room today. Um, how many people in the room are under the age of 35? Can you show by hand?
Okay. So from what I, what I see, it looks, it looks as though majority of the, of the folks who raised their hands were actually in our session. And we didn't, we didn't see you know, much in terms of a robust participation from uh, policy makers and other, other demographics. And so what, what we said there is that while you know, young people were thoroughly engaged in the um, you know, reporting process with the MasterCard Foundation, we think that we want more youth voices to be adequately and meaningfully represented at forums like this. Um, if you're going to talk about us, you, you need to engage us. You need us to be part of that process. And the process needs to be meaningful. <laughs> so I'll go on to talk about some of the key uh, messages that came out. Um, to give you some context, as part of the um, SEA uh, report, a youth ambassadors program was assembled. Um, that program includes five young people representing different demographics who, um, adequate, who meaningfully participated to the report uh, process. These young people were in WhatsApp groups. They were you know, engaged through videos, direct engagements of young people. Hundreds of young people were interviewed, um, you know, including those who were living in rural areas, those in urban areas. Um, and a parallel report is being written um, as part of the, of the process just for, you know, to rep capture the views of, of young people. And so some of the things that we talked about, um, we talked about girls. We talked about some of the gender gaps that keep um, girls out of school, things like teenage pregnancy and early marriage. We talked about the fact that while policies have been put in place to keep girls in school, um, overall attitudes towards girls' education haven't changed much. Young people are saying that uh, they want these policies to reflect the realities of the ground, on the ground. Um, the next point is on young people with disability. Um, young people with disability are often exempted from the classroom. They are not given the kind of opportunities that we give um, you know, other, other students. Uh, we think that should change. The next is on teachers. Young people indeed do recognize the important role that teachers play in delivering educational outcomes. And we actually think that better remuneration as motivation can get some top students or young people enthusiastic about even joining the teaching profession. However, we do recognize that teachers are themselves products of the weak education system that we are discussing here um, today. We agree um, with the group that the capacities of teachers need to be built to deliver the important skills young people need to succeed. Uh, we need to change we also need to change the way that young people are engaged in the classroom. So we, we've sat here over the last 48 hours and we've talked about you know, critical thinking and how these things are important. But you get to the classroom and, and there are some cultural barriers that really limit young people from exhibiting their skills. You know, you speak up and you are disrespectful, you speak up and you know, you're that bad kid. Really, you cannot challenge your teacher. It's about you learning from your teacher and that's it. We want a classroom that really fosters innovation and that comes with allowing young people the space and the flexibility to really say what's on their mind and to be able to practice those. Um, one suggestion that came out of the session was to create a platform as part of such discussions solely focused on um, you know, young people with, with disability. I think it would have been great if we had a session at this particular event on that. Um, young people are saying that they don't just want an education, they want their classroom activity and all that to be fun, they want it to be engaging, um, and they really want the flexibility to explore their passions and things that they are really interested in. And I, I want to really echo the importance of extracurricular activities, because that, that came up quite a bit in our, in our discussions. Um, in some countries, you know, that is compulsory and it's really been helpful. Uh, but in others, it hasn't been, you know. I can borrow from my personal, personal experience, you know, joining things like the debate club really helped me. Joining things like the drama club really helped me. And we think that in schools, young people should be given the opportunity to explore those because it's through those that they really gain the kind of skills that we are, we are talking about. It's not just about the classroom and someone really speaking. The top bottom sort of approach does not work. Uh, we want it to be practical. We want to be engaged in that process as well. Um, Kimberly Davis, who was from UNICEF, shared some ways that they were engaging um, young people as well. And I thought it was very, very interesting. I think organizations and policymakers in the room can borrow from how they really engage young people at every, you know, every step of the process, from you know, creating co-creating spaces that focus on human-centered design, 
to having them part, as part of the ideation process, monitoring and evaluation, um, constituting youth councils, and uh, really engaging young people meaningfully through like lead, lead, you know, them joining leadership and boards and, and, and so on. Um, so one of the things that we, we ended with, uh, which I'd like to end here today, was a question came up that was around, you know, what would an ideal curriculum look like for, for, for young people? And we tried to explore it with, um, you know, the few, the few minutes that we, we had. I think there was consensus with the young people in the room that we really value, um, you know, what exists today as the traditional approach, being, you know, just learning. But we want a component of our education that is really practical. So an example came up that if we have five models um, in a given semester, in a given, yeah, in a given semester, we could focus three on really getting the classroom activity going, but we want the remaining two to be more hands-on um, that will allow us to really develop the skills, skill set that we need. And so the last on the ideal curriculum was allowing young people to really develop their passions and, you know, the flexibility to, to, to do that and, and build the skill set that will allow them to live meaningful life. I believe I've captured what, what we talked about in the session. Thank you. Good. You see, when the youth talk, we listen. And because there are only very few here in the room, you can give him as much time as, uh, as possible. So uh, one more round of applause to this young man. Very good. Uh, very quickly before I invite uh, uh, Olivia, uh, one assumption here is that we are all teachers. And the teacher does not need to be in a classroom to teach. I'm going to go through very quickly in a minute the points that have been raised. And as a teacher, I want you to count your fingers as I, as I read the points. One, we need sensible allocation of, uh, of budgets to education in our countries. That's very important. Number two, policies must be robust enough. I'm going to give a test after, at the end of the, the, the five points that I'm going to give. Number three, we need to have an affirmative action on spending on education in our countries. Number four, our tax basis must be revo uh, reformed and uh, the gaps that we have in our tax system must be sealed. Number five, all, tax, all stakeholders must be engaged in reforming our education system and promoting proper financing for education in Africa. Number six, we need to increase revenue and focus more on funding education, deliberately increasing our, the percentages that we see today in our countries. Number seven, private sector financing must be a deliberate focus in our countries. Number eight, the youth must be engaged uh, as we talk about education reforms and development. If we talk about them and they're not with us, then uh, we are not uh, advancing the ideals and the agenda. Number nine, equality and equity in education is critical if we are to move uh, forward with the Agenda 2063 and also uh, the UN Agenda 2030. And lastly, number 10, we must build capacities of our teachers and our teachers must be properly remunerated. We pay them well, they give us the best because quality of our education will depend on that. I, I hope you remember those 10 points. At the end, I'm going to give uh, some tests to make sure that uh, I uh, certify that you passed uh, that exam. I'm now going to invite uh, Olivia Sagna, who is going to speak in French, uh, to give an overall reflection of uh, uh, this uh, uh, forum. Uh, Olivia, you want to stand here or you want to sit down there? Please. <laughs> Thank you. Donc, euh, cet après-midi, nous avons principalement discuté du yeah, nobody is perfect, so you have to take your headphone because I'm going to make my presentation in, in French. Donc cet après-midi, nous avons euh, principalement parlé du financement euh, de l'enseignement euh, secondaire sur des fonds propres et donc poser la question de la, de la durabilité. Euh, je vois pour les, pour les pays africains, pour les gouvernements africains, euh, un triple défi. 
euh, comment scolariser les effectifs euh, importants qui arrivent dans l'enseignement secondaire et qui proviennent des progrès importants réalisés euh, dans la scolarisation universelle. En même temps, nous avons euh, tous noté qu'il y a un grand nombre encore de, euh, de, de jeunes, d'enfants qui sont exclus du système éducatif. Donc comment scolariser ces exclus du euh, système éducatif nous nous sommes également accordés sur le fait que la formation technique et professionnelle est en quelque sorte la, la voie royale, le silver bullet pour nos, pour nos pays, mais nous savons que la formation technique et professionnelle coûte cher en termes de formation des enseignants, construction des structures de formation, équipement de ces structures de formation, maintenance des équipements et également de renouvellement de ces équipements qui, redeviennent, euh, qui deviennent rapidement euh, obsolètes. Donc je dirais que ça, ce sont les trois euh, défis majeurs autour du, du financement qui se posent euh, aux gouvernements euh, africains. Euh, maintenant, il y a également une, une autre question qui se pose. Euh, comment procéder à une allocation qui soit non pas forcément équitable, mais efficiente des ressources entre l'enseignement primaire, l'enseignement secondaire et l'enseignement euh, supérieur, sans qu'aucun des sous-secteurs ne soit euh, lésé, parce que ces trois sous-secteurs contribuent au développement économique de nos, euh, de nos pays. Nous avons vu dans un certain nombre de, de pays qui ont fait des progrès importants en termes de scolarisation euh, universelle, des euh, enquêtes de la Banque mondiale qui ont montré qu'en termes de développement économique, euh, l'impact était euh, quasiment nul, parce que dans le monde dans lequel nous vivons, euh, il ne suffit pas d'avoir été scolarisé dans l'enseignement euh, primaire, pour pouvoir avoir impacté après sur le développement économique. Donc il s'agit de voir quelle allocation, encore une fois, efficiente en fonction des plans de développement économique de nos, de nos pays, entre les différents euh, sous-secteurs, pour euh, pouvoir effectivement euh, atteindre les objectifs qui sont, euh, qui sont les nôtres. Il y a également la question de la, euh, de la gratuité, je pourrais dire de manière un peu provocatrice. Est-ce que la, 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 gra la gratuité euh, n'est-elle ne, pas... Euh, génératrice fondamentalement d'inégalités. Nous vivons dans des pays africains qui sont profondément inégalitaires. Lorsque les gouvernements décident de euh, promouvoir une politique qui est de gratuité pour tous, ça veut dire que, y compris euh, les classes les plus aisées de la société, y compris euh, la, la classe moyenne qui aurait des moyens d'accéder à l'école, et les pauvres sont placés sur un même pied d'égalité. Euh, Est-ce qu'il ne faudrait pas aller vers des systèmes qui euh, repose sur euh, un accès, je dirais, euh, payant, qui serait progressif, qui pourrait être de zéro pour les plus pauvres, et maintenant avec des, 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 des frais d'accès dans les systèmes euh, éducatifs qui seraient des, des, des frais euh, progressifs en fonction des euh, revenus. Je suis professeur d'université, mes enfants ont tous eu des bourses, parce que euh, la bourse est donnée sur la base des résultats euh, scolaires, mes enfants ont, ont une bourse au même titre que les fils de paysans qui ont eu énormément de difficultés à aller à l'école primaire, à aller à l'école secondaire, et après à aller à l'université, et la bourse que donne le gouvernement, pour ma fille c'est de l'argent de poche, parce que moi je lui, je lui donne beaucoup plus que ça, alors que pour certains étudiants qui viennent des milieux très défavorisés, cette bourse est insuffisante pour mener des études dans l'enseignement euh, supérieur. Euh, également, euh, comment on, euh, la, la, la question, on a beaucoup parlé des partenariats avec le secteur privé, la contribution du secteur privé, mais quelle contribution du secteur privé dans la majorité de nos pays, les, les petites et moyennes entreprises et même les très petites euh, entreprises et le secteur informel représentent entre 70 et 90% du tissu économique Comment ce secteur euh, informel qui représente euh, jusqu'à 90% du secteur euh, du tissu économique peut-il contribuer au financement du système euh, édu éducatif euh, C'est également la, la, la question euh, centrale de comment améliorer l'efficacité de la dépense publique. Euh, nous voyons tous que nos, 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 nos États font des efforts extrêmement importants euh, en termes d'allocation budgétaire pour globalement le secteur de l'éducation et je dirais que malgré tout, personne n'est satisfait du résultat. On nous dit qu'il y a euh, des centaines de millions de, de jeunes qui ne vont pas à l'école, on nous dit que l'efficacité interne n'est pas ce qu'elle devrait être, on nous dit que l'efficacité externe n'est pas ce qu'elle devrait être, les enseignants estiment que malgré tout ils ne sont mal payés, personne n'est satisfait alors que des sommes considérables sont injectées dans le système éducatif. Je pense qu'il faut également s'interroger sur l'efficacité de la dépense euh, publique dans le système éducatif, dans un environnement où les ressources sont rares. Euh, également, 
Je pense qu'il est important, et c'est articulé à ce que je disais tout à l'heure sur la, la gratuité, euh, comment créer véritablement des coalitions nationales euh, dans, 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 dans les pays pour euh, mobiliser des fonds euh, en direction du secteur éducatif et ces, ces coalitions doivent aller euh, au-delà du secteur privé, des bailleurs de fonds, du gouvernement, mais également euh, engager euh, les communautés qui font déjà des efforts relativement importants. Je pense que les, les communautés ne doivent pas être découragées de continuer à s'investir dans le financement de euh, l'éducation à travers des mots d'ordre qui tournent autour de la euh, gratuité. Euh, autre chose, euh, comment euh, pouvoir, parce que euh, ça a été dit à plusieurs reprises, euh, les gouvernements ne peuvent pas répondre à tous les besoins, euh, notamment dans le domaine de l'enseignement secondaire, mais c'est vrai pour les autres euh, ordres d'enseignement, de, les gouvernements ne peuvent pas faire face seul à l'ensemble des besoins. Comment maintenant développer notamment un enseignement secondaire euh, euh, privé à côté d'un enseignement supérieur public sans créer des systèmes à double vitesse où on aurait un système d'enseignement secondaire privé pour les riches et un système d'enseignement secondaire public pour les pauvres. C'est une autre équation à résoudre. Comment enfin, enfin pas enfin, un autre point, comment est-ce que l'on peut produire localement toute une série d'intrants qui sont nécessaires au système éducatif, à la fois pour aider à cette gratuité, entre guillemets, comment est-ce que l'on produit les manuels euh, les équipements euh, informatiques, euh, très souvent ce sont des équipements qui sont importés, pourquoi pas à l'échelle des pays, à l'échelle de la sous-région, à l'échelle des pays africains, euh, on, on ne pourrait pas construire nous-mêmes, notamment les ordinateurs dont on a besoin massivement dans les, euh, dans les, dans, 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 dans les écoles, la production des manuels scolaires qui très souvent ce sont des manuels scolaires produits à la fois en termes de contenu et produits je dirais économiquement dans les pays euh, du nord, euh, comment faire en sorte donc de stimuler l'économie locale euh, à travers donc son implication dans la production d'intrants pour le système éducatif, parce que le système éducatif, c'est aussi euh, un sous-secteur euh, économique. Enfin, euh, notre ami l'avait indiqué tout, tout à l'heure, comment est-ce que l'on peut avoir un système d'enseignement euh, secondaire qui prenne plus en compte les aspirations, euh, les visions, les comportements, les usages des jeunes, et non pas seulement la vision des gouvernements, du secteur privé, des bailleurs de, euh, des bailleurs de fonds, parce qu'ils ont euh, effectivement... Euh, on, on dit souvent qu'il y a un décalage entre les, les enseignants et les, et les structures de formation qui datent du XXe siècle alors que nous sommes dans le XXIe siècle. Je crois que compte tenu de l'importance démographique euh, des jeunes aussi, il est important de pouvoir prendre en compte, encore une fois, leurs aspirations, euh, leurs visions, leurs usages, leurs comportements pour savoir quel type de système d'enseignement euh, secondaire mettre euh, en œuvre. Alors j'ai posé beaucoup de... Beaucoup de questions, peut-être beaucoup de, beaucoup de problèmes auxquels il faut apporter des solutions. Euh, je crois qu'une une, une piste de réflexion peut-être pour l'ADA, ce, ce serait de, de, de lancer véritablement un, un grand chantier autour de la transparence du financement de euh, l'enseignement secondaire et au-delà du secteur éducatif d'une manière générale. D'où viennent les financements on doit pouvoir tracer la part des bailleurs de fonds, des gouvernements, du secteur privé, des communautés, euh, etc., etc. Comment maintenant sont allouées ces, ces ressources, encore une fois, de, de manière transversale dans l'ensemble du euh, système euh, éducatif pour voir où sont les redondances, où sont euh, les, les, les sommes qui ne sont pas utilisées comme elles devraient, les, comme elles devraient être euh, utilisées. Euh, je crois que c'est un chantier extrêmement important puisque, encore une fois, depuis des années et des années, les gouvernements africains font des efforts, même s'ils sont jugés insuffisants, font des efforts extrêmement importants en termes d'allocation budgétaire au système éducatif. Et je pense que si on veut véritablement voir où se situe le problème, et ça a été dit dans notre, dans notre groupe, on a cité le cas de, de Singapour, donc qui alloue un, per, un pourcentage à son système éducatif qui est quasiment équivalent au pourcentage alloué dans certains euh, euh, pays africains et avec des résultats qui ne sont absolument pas comparables. Donc comment Singapour, avec 3% par exemple de son produit intérieur brut, peut avoir un système euh, éducatif qui est aujourd'hui donné en exemple et comment dans nos pays, lorsque nous, si nous mettons également 3% de notre produit intérieur brut, nous n'arriverons pas à obtenir les mêmes euh, standards. Je pense que nous avons besoin de, de réponses à ces questions parce que tous les guichets 
à laquelle, au, au, auquel on, on s'adresse euh, sont quelque part fatigués de donner des allocations supplémentaires au secteur de l'éducation. Lorsque vous allez voir les bailleurs de fonds, ils vont estimer qu'ils donnent déjà beaucoup. Lorsque vous vous adressez au ministère des Finances, il va vous dire qu'ils donnent déjà beaucoup. Vous allez aller voir le secteur privé, il va dire qu'ils donnent beaucoup pour des maigres résultats. Vous allez voir les ménages, vous allez voir les communautés qui estiment contribuer. Et encore une fois, avec cette insatisfaction générale, donc je crois qu'une étude sur la transparence de, à la fois de l'origine et de l'utilisation des financements euh, du secteur éducatif d'une manière générale, je pense que ça serait une pierre euh, importante qui pourrait être euh, apportée, une contribution importante apportée par euh, la DEA, par exemple, à travers un, un ICQN. Voilà, je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Olivia. That was a comprehensive uh, reflection of uh, the two days uh, forum. I would like to request you again to give this team here another round of applause. Thank you very much. Now you may uh, take your seats on the other side so that we can go or move forward to the next uh, part of uh, this fo forum. We're actually coming closer to the end. At this moment, I would like to invite uh, the overall rapporteur, uh, Mr. Bill Kataria or Jean-Marie to come here and give us uh, the synthesis of uh, the two days uh, forum. Alors, la tâche est très ardue. Oh, first of all, I'm going to express myself in, in French. You know that the principle is that if you have a working language, it should be the language that you master the most. My knowledge of English is not good enough, you know, to reflect my thinking in this language. So, uh, I apologize because the majority here speak English, so I'm going to use French. Alors... Uh, Peut-être très rapidement, avant de vous faire cette synthèse générale, j'aimerais vous dire un peu dans quel esprit je, je vous présente cette synthèse. Je ne vais pas faire un rapport, disons, administratif et puis, comment est-ce que je dirais, séquentiel de ce qui s'est passé pendant ces deux jours, mais je vais me limiter à une présentation, disons, synthétique et vous amener, disons, à travers ce que je considère comme un fil conducteur qui est le thème, disons, de ces deux jours de, 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 de forum. Alors, l'enseignement secondaire en Afrique, préparer les jeunes au monde du travail. Pourquoi ce thème et quel est le lien entre l'enseignement secondaire et le monde du travail, serait-on tenté de dire Pour le comprendre, il est important de souligner certains défis de développement auxquels notre continent est confronté, comme l'a souligné le président Cyril Ramaphosa dans son allocution d'ouverture. Je pense que le président a posé le contexte et il est très important de rappeler un peu les principaux points qu'il a soulevés. Avec ses ressources minérales et hydrauliques, ses forêts et ses terres fertiles, dont environ 60% ne sont pas exploitées, l'Afrique est décrite comme le continent le plus riche, mais sa ressource la plus rentable est celle de sa jeunesse. Et ça a été très bien dit que la majorité, disons, de la population, ce sont des jeunes, des jeunes de moins de 25 ans, etc. Mais ce sont ces jeunes qui sont ensuite touchés par le chômage, alors que des secteurs comme l'agriculture ou bien les services ont besoin de beaucoup de main d'œuvre pour, disons, enrôler ces jeunes. Mais le problème, c'est que ces jeunes n'ont pas les compétences requises parce que les systèmes éducatifs par lesquels ils sont passés, ne leur permet pas d'acquérir ces compétences. Alors, pour profiter des opportunités d'emploi des jeunes offertes par l'agriculture et les services, il faut revoir complètement les systèmes éducatifs pour que les jeunes puissent, à travers les systèmes éducatifs, acquérir euh, ces compétences. Mais cela demande aussi la disponibilité d'enseignants 
de formateurs. Et puis, une chose que le président a dite aussi, c'est qu'il faut corriger l'idée que tous ceux qui passent par le secondaire doivent automatiquement aller, disons, au supérieur et de considérer aussi le secondaire comme un moment très important de la vie des jeunes parce que c'est là où ils peuvent développer beaucoup d'énergie, mais c'est là où ils sont le plus fragiles aussi parce que soumis à beaucoup d'influences sociales défavorables. Alors, préparer les jeunes au monde du travail, c'est les amener à acquérir les compétences futures dans un contexte marqué par la nature changeante du travail, comme l'a souligné M. Siswe Nkassana du groupe de travail Sifizo. Alors, on parle beaucoup de la quatrième révolution industrielle, de l'importance des compétences relatives à la pensée critique, mais on constate que lorsque certains de nos pays, disons, sont soumis à des tests internationaux, on constate que là où le bas blesse, c'est qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de pensée critique dans le programme d'éducation que nous proposons aux, aux enfants. Donc aujourd'hui, avec la quatrième voie, la quatrième, voire la cinquième révolution industrielle, les jeunes doivent disposer d'une palette de compétences, en plus des compétences de base académique. Il s'agit de compétences de collaboration, de pensée critique, de créativité, la capacité à travailler les autres, avec les autres, etc. Alors, la question qui se pose pour les pays africains est la suivante. Est-ce qu'on va rester encore avec ce schéma classique que nous connaissons depuis des générations, depuis des décennies Si c'est le cas, nos jeunes vont rester à la traîne et ne pourront pas du tout être intégrés au monde du travail, comme euh, ça a été dit. Alors, ça a des implications pour des pays aussi, par exemple l'Afrique du Sud qui a réalisé la gratuité de l'enseignement, euh, presque 100% euh, d'accès, etc., mais qui est confronté aussi au problème de qualité de l'apprentissage, de pertinence de, de, de l'apprentissage. Alors, dans ces conditions, comment influencer l'apprentissage des jeunes dans ce monde digital qui évolue rapidement donc, là aussi, l'accent qui est mis sur les connaissances et pas suffisamment sur les compétences con contribue à créer un fossé entre les pays riches et les pays pauvres ou en développement. Et des études montrent que ça prendra encore dix ans si on ne fait rien du tout pour changer ce paradigme. Alors, un des grands défis aussi en Afrique du Sud, tout comme dans les autres pays, c'est le problème de la certification avec les cadres nationaux de, qualifi de qualification qui ne permettent pas de mesurer les compétences requises pour le monde de travail. Ça permet de, 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 de mesurer les connaissances acquises, mais pas les compétences. Donc, il faudrait peut-être combiner ces cadres nationaux de qualification avec des cadres de mesure des compétences. Encore faut-il que les enseignants qui sont restés dans le système et qui ont été formés eux-mêmes dans un moule rigide dispose de ces compétences pour pouvoir enseigner. Donc, on ne peut pas parler de qualité, de pertinence dans l'éducation sans enseignants bien formés. Et une des raisons aussi pour lesquelles les enseignants ne sont pas bien formés, c'est que dans certains pays, les facultés de pédagogie qui sont chargées de leur donner ces connaissances n'ont pas dans leur curriculum des, disons, des thèmes qui ont trait à l'acquisition de compétences. Ça reste encore des connaissances euh, académiques. Alors, pour changer cette situation, il faudrait, comme ça se fait en Corée, recruter ou en Finlande aussi, les meilleurs étudiants pour en faire des enseignants euh, compétents. Mais aussi, il faut revoir la langue d'enseignement. Et puis aussi, il faut considérer les nouvelles technologies et l'intelligence artificielle comme une possibilité de contribution même si nous sommes conscients que la nouvelle technologie, l'intelligence artificielle ne remplacera jamais de bons enseignants dans les salles de classe. Alors, compte tenu de cette analyse profonde qui nous a été proposée aussi bien par le président que par le représentant de euh, CIFISO, pour vraiment aider les jeunes à acquérir les compétences futures dans un contexte marqué par la nature changeante du travail, il nous faut une révolution, une véritable révolution de nos systèmes éducatifs. 
Or, on sait très bien que les gouvernements sont très lents à opérer des changements dans les institutions gouvernementales. Donc, dans cette optique, euh, on pourrait aussi considérer la participation de toutes les parties prenantes pour aider à opérer euh, cette révolution. Donc, l'enseignement secondaire dans cette optique, pourrait-il nous servir de plateforme de travail Quels sont les messages clés que nous pourrions tirer du rapport de la Fondation Mastercard sur l'enseignement secondaire en Afrique Tout d'abord, pourquoi le secondaire est maintenant euh, Là, je ne vais pas insister sur ce qui a déjà été dit. Il y a la référence à l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine. Il y a la référence au CESA 2015-2025 sur la stratégie continentale euh, de l'éducation pour l'Afrique. Il y a aussi référence, disons, à l'agenda 2030, auquel tous nos pays ont souscrit et qui prône non seulement l'accès, mais aussi l'équité euh, pour tous. Donc, euh, on estime que le secondaire sera une plateforme clé pour les jeunes Africains pour entrer dans le monde du travail, surtout que sur 100 élèves qui entrent au primaire et au secondaire, il n'y en a que 9 qui iront au supérieur et sur ces 9, il n'y aura, aura que 6 qui vont terminer le cursus. Donc ça veut dire que tous les enfants qui ont accès, disons, à l'éducation et qui devraient être préparés pour le monde de travail se retrouvent surtout au niveau du secondaire. Donc c'est pour ça que le secondaire euh, devient une plateforme intéressante pour préparer les jeunes pour le monde de travail. Mais pour cela, il faut un changement de paradigme pour faire de l'éducation secondaire une plateforme pour l'emploi. Il faut en conséquence réimaginer, redessiner, réinventer l'enseignement secondaire avec comme préoccupation principale la dotation et la certification de connaissances et de compétences permettant aux jeunes de développer leur potentiel plutôt qu'un mécanisme de sélection pour l'enseignement supérieur. Face au défi, de Mastercard, de, au défi pardon, du marché de l'emploi, donc secteur formel et surtout aussi secteur non formel, et compte tenu des besoins en main d'œuvre, le secondaire va jouer un rôle très important. Donc, il faudra tenir compte du secteur informel, mais aussi de la croissance démographique et de la digitalisation. Donc, des réformes diverses entreprises au niveau du secondaire, des réformes curriculaires, l'investissement des gouvernements. Mais malgré cela, euh, la faible qualité d'apprentissage dans beaucoup de pays euh, les, de, à bas revenus va être un problème aussi et les dispositions scolaires au niveau du secondaire. Des efforts significatifs pour introduire des curricula basés sur les approches par compétences ont été faits, mais des problèmes de l'approche d'enseignement demeurent encore. Alors, une question, c'est de savoir quelles sont les compétences euh, dont les jeunes ont besoin pour être préparés pour le monde du travail, des compétences de base en lecture, calcul, sciences, des compétences du 21e siècle, mais des compétences surtout pour le monde du travail. Qu'en est-il pour les enseignants qui doivent transmettre ces compétences Il faut aussi des mécanismes flexibles pour l'apprentissage et non le mécanisme linéaire actuel que nous connaissons et surtout pour ce qui concerne le non formel. Les gouvernements investissent dans le secondaire, mais souvent aux dépens aussi du, du primaire. Cela ne devrait pas être aux dépens de la qualité ou de l'accès au primaire. Okay. I ask him to let me know when it is 10 minutes left, but he says it is only 5 minutes left. OK, I will do with that. OK. Donc, euh, j'étais, disons, je reprenais surtout la présentation qui a été largement faite par Mastercard. Alors, je ne vais pas euh, insister là-dessus. Bon, on peut se poser des questions, mais qu'est-ce que cela veut dire pour des pays comme l'Afrique du Sud, donc qui ont réalisé presque 100% d'accès, 
mais qui sont confrontés encore à des problèmes de qualité d'apprentissage. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour des pays comme le Niger, qui, connaît un, qui connaissent un taux de déperdition scolaire très, très élevé et qui sont confrontés aussi aux problèmes de qualité d'apprentissage pour la RDC, etc., etc. Mais peut-être, comme il reste très peu de temps, je vais venir plutôt à la nécessité de réforme. Donc, pour opérer ce changement de paradigme, il faut opérer des réformes très, très profondes. Donc, certains pays y ont procédé, comme le Ghana, par exemple, en, en, en adoptant une approche holistique, en essayant de revoir carrément leur système euh, secondaire et aussi de formation euh, d'enseignement technique et professionnel sur la base des mauvais résultats qu'ils ont connus avec des évaluations euh, internationales. Certains pays comme le Gabon ont misé sur euh, l'approche par compétence en introduisant par exemple un système d'apprentissage dual avec alternance entre la classe et le, 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 le lieu du travail. Au Sénégal, en procédant par une réforme totale du système éducatif avec l'approche par compétence, en voyant aussi les différents niveaux d'éducation, mais en voyant aussi le financement. En Angola, en misant aussi sur le, non, le secteur non formel, etc. Mais malgré toutes ces avancées, il y a des, des questions clés qui demeurent. Je ne vais pas les énumérer, si j'avais le temps, je le ferais, mais ce sont ces questions clés qui ont été débattues dans les sessions parallèles, que ce soit autour des réformes ou bien autour aussi du financement, parce que le financement, c'est le nerf de la guerre. Alors, en conclusion, je dirais que, après deux jours de travail intensif ici, nous n'avons fait qu'aborder le sujet. Vous êtes d'accord avec moi que ce n'est pas en deux jours qu'on peut épuiser, disons, un thème aussi important. Alors la question, comment aller au-delà de ce que nous avons fait pendant ces deux jours et dans les sessions parallèles Alors comme l'a dit l'intervenant précédent, le professeur Sagna, je pense que c'est à travers la constitution d'un pôle de qualité interpays sur le secondaire qui nous permettra d'avoir une réflexion partagée sur les défis et les enjeux du secondaire comme plateforme pour préparer les élèves pour le monde de travail et qui nous permettra aussi d'avoir une vision concertée sur les stratégies et les réformes à entreprendre pour la mise en œuvre, disons, d'un système d'enseignement de, de, secondaire euh, servant de plateforme pour la préparation des jeunes pour le monde de l'emploi. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. I think you are taller than me. Uh, obviously, that's why this thing is above my head. But uh, thank you very much for the comprehensive uh, synthesis that we've done. Uh, I know everybody feels that or agrees with us that it, it, you have captured uh, the most important aspects of the discussions that have taken place since yesterday morning uh, to this, uh, this afternoon. And uh, uh, now, uh, based on all these discussions, reports, uh, reflections, and synthesis, uh, a team of young women and men has come up sat together uh, from ADEA, from MasterCard, from uh, the South African government, from the African Development Bank, uh, to prepare a draft statement, uh, which, well, a draft ministerial statement, uh, to which I will uh, request the executive director of ADEA to read it to us. Welcome, uh, Halbert. Good evening. I'm, try, I'm going to try and be as short as possible. Uh, as the moderator has just uh, said, it, this is a draft. It's a draft uh, declaration because we still need to share with uh, our ministers, uh, delegations, uh, to get their input so that we can come up with a final draft, uh, a final declaration that can be shared among uh, the stakeholders. So this is the draft declaration. 
the preamble is we, the ministers attending the first ADEA high level annual policy dialogue forum in Johannesburg, South Africa, from July 29 to 30th, uh, 2019. Considering the African Union vision and strategies for Africa's sustainable development embodied in Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, the Continental Education Strategy for Africa 2016-2025, what is known as CESA 2016-25, uh, the Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa, STISA 2024, as well as the Continental Technical, Vocational, and Education Training Strategy. Aware of the sustainable development goals adopted by all United Nations member states, defining as specific targets to be achieved by 2030 and the related implications for Africa. Appreciating the need to put people at the heart of economic and social policy and business practices. Reiterating the need for Africa to invest in its young people as the continent's highest yielding resource in order to reap maximum benefits from the continent's demographic dividend. Appreciating the opportunities that the fourth industrial revolution present in improving our economies. Recognizing the secondary education is increasingly becoming the platform for preparing you for the world of work and hence the need for a paradigm shift in reforming the subsector. Cognizant that 46 million more young Africans will enroll in secondary education by 2030, noting that the completion of quality secondary education is key to significantly reducing dependence on insecure employment for young people. Recognizing the common need to increase the number of teachers and improve the teaching quality by raising entry requirements to restore status and effectiveness of the teaching profession. Noting the critical importance of technology in leapfrogging the improvement of education and the need to focus more on indigenous languages to improve learning. Now hereby agree to reform secondary education in Africa by attracting strong applicants in teaching profession and training and retraining adequate numbers of teachers to function effectively in enhancing the quality learning and skills provision in the modern economy. Providing foundational cognitive skills, especially in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, digital and soft or 21st century skills, such as emotional intelligence, unstructured problem solving and reasoning skills, as well as interpersonal and communication skills, skills for the world of work for young people to increase their adaptability and resilience. Providing flexible pathways between general education and TVET for the, young, for the youth population, either facing challenges continuing the, the education or leaving the system entirely, embracing innovation and the use of integrated information and communication technologies putting in place effective mechanisms for coordinating different TVET actors and for promoting flexible pathways between general education and TVET. Offering skills in the entire value chain of the dominant agriculture sector and the growing sector, service sector, including ICT, customer services and sales and human resources in areas such as entertainment, restaurants, tourism, 
transport, and others. Developing curricula that are relevant to and promote economic growth and sustainable development. According greater priority to STEM education and digitization and linking the education management information system to the labor market information. Expanding the focus of ed tech innovation beyond marginalized population. Strengthening collaboration among stakeholders to increase the pace of implementing challenge changes, for example, by having regular public-private partnership dialogue. Exploring and implementing innovative financing mechanisms for sustainability. And last but not least, support the establishment of an inter-country quality node, known as the ICQN, on secondary education to carry the next steps. This is therefore adopted on 30th July and of course, before I adopt it, as I said, we need to share with ministers and delegates uh, to make sure that uh, we incorporate all their inputs or comments so that we can share the final uh, declaration. So this is the uh, draft of the declaration that I wanted to share with you, and I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Executive Director, uh, Secretary, sorry. Uh, one more round of applause for that comprehensive document. Thank you very much. I think we're excited that we have an outcome document, a declaration, which is draft, which is going to be adopted once uh, uh, it's cleared by the various governments represented here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, it is my pleasure to invite uh, uh, the MC, if he's around, uh, to come and finalize or uh, take up uh, the final part of this uh, meeting. Mr. Mweli, is he around? No, if he's not around, then... Uh, okay. <laughs> and as he comes to the stage, in my small village in Kenya, when you stand in front of people and you say something that is exciting, you are always promised a cup of tea. I do hope that the Honorable Minister of South Africa, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Madam uh, uh, Mutshenga, uh, will invite me for a cup of milk tea one of these fine days. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, uh, colleague. Uh, we'll organize not only a cup of uh, tea with milk, we'll organize a kettle of tea with milk <laughs> so that you stay longer in South Africa. Uh, we're now going to uh, take on items on the closing ceremony, and I'm going to humbly request the minister uh, to come up stage and then also uh, request the representative of uh, items. Okay, I've been advised that learners are waiting to render a cultural item. The minister wouldn't allow that she takes the podium uh, until learners. <laughs> Render a cultural item. Are we ready, Mr. Matthews? Yes. Yes. Okay. We, we're going to get the cultural item, and then after that, we'll take the speeches, and then they'll come back again to do the two national anthems. I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's been a wonderful two days of enriching discussions, Albert said on the first day, we've limited uh, the number of PowerPoint uh, presentations. 
We want people to share experiences. We want people to learn from each other. And I hope that uh, uh, that is what has happened in the past two days. Do you agree with me? Uh, can you please give yourselves a big hand of applause, especially that you started and stayed the course up to the end. I'm sure you can do a bigger hand of applause for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are our wonderful learners. We, we showcasing our own talent from schools. Uh, as I said uh, on the first day, this is part of what we are inculcating to these young people who are our greatest asset uh, in basic education in South Africa. Can you please applaud them? They look so tiny and wonderful. <laughs> I was wondering as to whether some of them are not supposed to be at crash. But I'm told that they are at primary school and high school. Okay. Ngatiboyi ki stage. Ufuna bakabe. Okay. Is anbandona bam? Come up stage. You are now elevated. Can you see that? Huh? You are assets of the nation. Do you know that? Good.
Thank you very much. A big hand of applause. They've really been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for, for those who maybe didn't understand, this is how we do waltz and tango uh, in Africa. Uh, this is how we do gymnastics. Uh, and I hope you enjoy that. And I'm sure we can give them a big hand of applause again. Thank you. Well, we have a very short uh, session. I'm now going to invite you to welcome the uh, representative of the MasterCard Foundation, Kimberly Kerr. Would you please put your hands together as she come up stage? Okay, thank you very much. So I, I wanted to start my closing remarks with uh, a few words about Adea. Adea for us represents the voice of education in Africa. They play a vital role bringing cutting edge uh, ideas and expertise and evidence to their peers in Africa, organizing opportunities for various countries to share expertise, and providing targeted support and technical expertise to countries. But they also play a vital role internationally by sharing the African perspective and priorities with other international actors working in the education space. The foundation has been working closely with Adea over the last couple of years, and more recently we've been working closely together on the report Secondary Education Africa and the Future of Work. And this event for me is an excellent reminder of both the convening power of Adea as well as the value add that you bring into this space. And of course, the strength of Adea depends very much on the active engagement of the countries that they represent. So thank you, Adea, for all of your fantastic efforts in pulling this event together. I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank the honorable ministers of education and their representatives present here. It is a rare and unique opportunity to be able to discuss together your strategies, priorities, challenges, constraints, and the trade-offs that you face. I know that there are many, many demands on your time, so we want to thank you for spending your time here. The contributions that have been made through these discussions to the study that we're preparing have been invaluable from our perspective. And we hope that you see the report as your report and that you see your ideas, your suggestions, and your recommendations represented there. And I particularly wanted to thank the Government of South Africa and the Ministry of Basic Education and the Minister who has been here for the entire session. Uh, time and again throughout the entire two days, so many examples have been raised of innovative approaches and ideas that South Africa is implementing in the secondary education space. And I think that we appreciate all of the frankness in which those have been shared, both what's working and what's not working. And I think that there's much to learn from the experience uh, that you have shared with us today. And finally, I wanted to thank uh, the youth ambassadors, Joseph, who did the presentation from the group discussion uh, Joseph was part of the strategic advisory group for the report and he represented very ably the views of the youth representatives that participated in the study. Um, but I also want to thank the other youth representative that was here and all of the, the youth ambassadors for the report who have done so much work behind the scenes to represent the voice of young people. We're very excited that there will be a specific report that reflects their views uh, that will be accessible but we'll also be sure that their, reviews, uh, their views are reflected in the report that we're preparing. And of course, the report is only the midway point, as I had mentioned. We hope that they remain very active and engaged in the dissemination of findings. 
I just wanted to share a few observations from my perspective, what uh, stood out for me. There was so uh, much rich discussion, so many challenges, so many strategies um, and innovations that are being explored, but I thought it would be um, useful to share a few things that were on my mind at the end of the two days. One, I think that secondary education is not only an education imperative, it's an economic imperative. So drawing the connections between education and economic growth and increased productivity for young people is essential. And this, uh, this argument uh, needs to be taken beyond education circles to ministries of finance and to the private sector and other actors so that they too can become champions for secondary education. And then I was reflecting a little bit on some of the, the big barriers um, that if they were unlocked, could be a potential lever for change. And there were three that really stood out for me. One is curriculum. And we know that there are lots of efforts and reforms underway around curriculum. Somebody referred to it yesterday as the engine of the education system. It's the translation of the goals of countries um, and the goals of education into the classrooms. It's the guide that teachers use um, for, for instruction of young people. And the fact that so many countries are embarking on education curricula reform, I think is a good signal of the value of this kind of gathering where uh, ideas around that and experiences can be exchanged. The second is foundational skills at primary. I was really struck in one of the first ministerial roundtables around the experience of Niger and that after the first year of secondary education, they found that students didn't, many students didn't possess uh, strong enough foundational skills to continue. So they were either sent back to primary or they were moved into the TVET system. And in many ways, that is a tragedy because one, it uh, wastes the resources that were invested in those young people at the primary education level. Um, but also, it must be incredibly discouraging for the young people, and I'm sure it contributes to dropout and um, leaving, leaving the education system. So the foundational, the importance of foundational skills at primary as the, the foundation for learning at secondary education level really can't be underscored enough. And the third area is around teacher quality. So teachers has come up over and over and over again, and, and there's so many things to do in the teacher education space. But what really stood out for me is the importance of very strong initial teacher education, and, that, uh, and then the promotion of the best teachers into positions as instructional leaders, and creating, you know, through that, creating a virtuous circle. And that reforming teacher quality is actually a long-term endeavor, and we have to think of it that way. Um, but we need to start at the beginning where teachers become uh, educators. I said three, but I actually have four. <laughs> the last one is around assessment. Uh, we know that what is measured is what is valued. And there's been lots of discussion so far throughout the last two days around curriculum. The importance of aligning curriculum with, uh, or aligning assessments with the competency-based curriculums finding new ways to measure those competencies, and a greater role for teachers in school-based assessments in the overall assessment system for young people. Two more things I wanted to highlight. One is the importance of political will, that education reform is a long-term endeavor, and we need to ensure that reforms are spread beyond changes in political leadership. It was a question that was asked, maybe not answered, but a question that was asked from the group about how to sustain some of the um, reforms and changes that are been, have been implemented over the long term. I think that that's um, something that we need to continue to explore together. And then finally, there were a few um, ideas around innovative financing uh, strategies to address some of the gaps uh, that countries face when they think about expanding education. Uh, the, the example of Ghana and the use of oil revenues, uh, the example from South Africa of having industry donate or, or contribute a percentage of their funding for skill training in that sector, and some of the many ideas that came up in the efficiency section for how to free up uh, resources. Those were all very interesting. So those are the things that stood out to me. I just wanted to wrap up with two next steps from my perspective. 
Uh, one, the secondary education in Africa report will be launched in early 2020. We're still figuring out where that will be launched, but we look forward to uh, finalizing that and making it available to everyone. We're hoping that once the report is launched that we can uh, undertake in-depth uh, country dissemination. So engage in a dialogue alongside ADEA at the country level where we can share the findings in greater depth uh, and get feedback uh, from actors at the national level as well as governments. And I finally wanted to say that I, I hope that many countries represented here today will join the ICQN on secondary education. Uh, we think that that will be a key vehicle for moving forward some of the recommendations uh, and promising practices that come from the report itself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kimberly, and uh, please convey our appreciation and thanks to the foundation for the wonderful work that the foundation is doing. And uh, thank you also for your very comprehensive observations. I am now going to invite the Executive Secretary of ADEA. Albert, I want to call your surname in my home language, in saying Yomba. Is it close to it? Great. Give me a big hand of applause. This man is wonderful. He speaks English and French simultaneously. And that's what you owe me. You owe me French and Portuguese. Okay, over to you, Albert. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think you've, you've seen me so many times here, so I will try to go quickly so that you don't start complaining that you, I have been uh, coming every time. So let me go quickly. Uh, I'll try to be as quickly as possible so that I can allow the minister uh, as the host to make the final closing uh, remarks. So basically mine is again to thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you from the country itself. Uh, South Africa for accepting to host this wonderful forum. Uh, actually, this is the first uh, of this kind that we've initiated together with MasterCard Foundation. We hope this kind of exercise will continue. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we, we realize that we need opportunities to bring together African countries. As our, heads of, as our he head of states, meet a summit to discuss how to integrate uh, countries, region, how to come up with a continental framework for economic and social development, I think we need to pick the momentum and make sure that we involve in education, we, we play our part in engaging, in trying to make sure that we learn from each other, and I think that's really our responsibility. That's what I believe and that I think that we need to keep bringing uh, whenever possible and be able to, to discuss. As I said, we deliberately wanted to have a forum with less presentation and more discussion. I think this one has happened. It has happened in during the plenary. It has happened during the group discussion, the group sessions. Because a forum is actually a platform for people to share. It's not a place where one will come and teach others. Because we all come from different perspective, different expertise. And it's important that we are able to discuss and share uh, challenges, perspective, and so on and so forth. That's really what I feel is a forum. And I think uh, this is the first one we may have not achieved, you know, whatever we wanted to achieve, but this is a learning process. Uh, we hope if we were to organize next year a similar uh, forum, we can build from this and improve. I believe that's really very important. So thank you, Minister. I was saying with really being a host country, we really appreciate for South Africa to have accepted to host uh, the first forum of this kind. And we hope many more to come on subject that touch on education uh, is important. But let me also thank other partners, so MasterCard Foundation, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the kind of work that you did uh, for ADEA. But I will say the same. 
uh, MasterCard Foundation is uh, one of the few foundations that's really focusing on Africa, uh, that focus on youth empowerment, uh, leadership, youth leadership, uh, education and training. So that's really very important. So we are really a good partner, and I believe we'll continue uh, this uh, uh, journey and to make sure that education reach uh, the vision that Africa is looking for and beyond. Let me also uh, thank other partners. Of course, the African Development Bank, our mother institution, uh, for supporting us uh, uh, in many ways as we work together. And I believe we'll continue to work together to support education and training uh, within the continent. Let me also thank again ministers that are here. Uh, we have expected more ministers to join. Unfortunately, for a number of reasons, and a number of them could not make it. But the ones that are here, let me thank you for taking your time. We wanted to give you an opportunity to share and that you did it well. I think, to me, what I'm picking from here, as far as Adair is concerned, is to learn from or to pick from the recommendations that came up and see how best we can take them forward in terms of engaging with countries through this inter-country quality note. I think we still believe there are in-depth research that can come out of the discussion that happened here that we need to take and we'll actually be calling countries to take lead on this uh, different research so that if we were to meet again next time, we are able to share uh, additional information and additional practices that, we, uh, that will be coming uh, from the countries uh, themselves. So without taking too much time, uh, let me again uh, thank everyone uh, for taking your time to be here. Uh, let me uh, make sure that uh, we will be able to share the final uh, resolutions uh, of uh, this important forum, and we will keep you informed on the next steps as time goes. So for example, from the reports, we will definitely need countries to be associated in the process of launching the final reports. We'll be making sure that uh, uh, a few next steps that have been discussed are taken into practice, and Adair will play its part uh, to make sure that uh, this happens. Last but not least, let me thank the team. The team from DBE and Adair. I was going to forget you. You did a great job. Thank you. I, I, I want you to applaud them. They did a great job. <laughs> I think collaboration started from there. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that done. Uh, I think it has been more than enough that you started really engaging uh, together. And this is the kind of collaboration that we would like to see uh, within uh, our continent. And that's the only way we can make the difference that we are looking for and improvement as well. Thank you so much for all. Thank you very much, uh, Albert. And let's continue the excellent work that Adia is doing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to invite the Honorable Minister of uh, Basic Education in the Republic of South Africa. Would you please join me in welcoming her on stage? Thank you. No, thank you very much, Program Director. Let me also thank our dear leadership for the forum and also making us the host of this very important forum to ministers from different parts of the continent, deputy ministers, representatives of different countries that were present, to our sponsors, MasterCard, World Bank. Thank you very much also for ensuring that we have a very successful forum. To our partners and distinguished guests, good evening. Oh, Jumela, you want it in suit? Abshen, oh, the the peril, the matekwan, kuenach. So we have eleven official languages here uh, in the country. So indeed, program director, we also agree that discussions that took place in the last two days do confirm that education and training, and the world of work, needs us to work in a very integrated manner especially in relation to the needs of our young people. The discussions also reveal that in addition to developing skills and competences in preparing our young people to enter the world of work, 
schools and workplaces working together need to reorientate, accommodate, and enable our young people for the future. As education departments, we, the, the, the forum did confirm that we need to continue experimenting with new concepts of education and training to respond to the needs of our, of our young people. And in doing so, we have to reconceptualize our curriculum on an ongoing basis to strengthen our teacher development programs around our planning and information management and include in industry researchers and also NGOs in making sure that we remain relevant. The discussions also confirm that as governments, we need to put more emphasis on the information systems, not just to provide planning information, but also to decentralize it so that we can track the learning skills and outcomes that our young people derive and also use the information that is derived from different research reports across the world so that we also have ready data driven interventions that are informed by reality on the ground. So what is very important that came from the discussions that we have to address also the many manifestations of social decadence that our kids are going through by providing them with the necessary skills and competencies so that the real assets that our children are can continue to be a blessing to the continent and the entire globe. I am program director confident that discussions in the last two days will go a long way towards an integrated regional continental approach to modernizing our post primary opportunities and outcomes. And I believe that we owe this to our children. Let me thank Adia for acting, I quote, as a lever of change and elevating the voice of Africa on education priorities at regional, continental, and global level, a close quote. As a country, we are looking forward to more of these forums as they provide an opportunity to dialogue with our counterparts to really, even beyond education, to find, uh, yesterday it was a day of friendship, but to also find, to strengthen the brotherhood and the sisterhood <coughs> amongst ourselves as people of the continent but also to dialogue and engage with experts and partners and make the dawn of Africa a reality. So I want to thank, I want to take this opportunity, Chair, to, more, to thank again the ministers, the deputy ministers, experts, the resource people that were here, the academics that are always with us, who joined us and openly shared lessons, allowing us to learn from each other. I also want to, I wish to thank all the participants the young people that were here, the teacher unions, I saw some of our teacher unions from the country, the media, public and private education practitioners, as well as supporters of education from across Africa and beyond. And to the partners, African Development Bank and MasterCard, again, I want to join Adia for thanking you most sincerely for helping us to make this dialogue a reality. We will indeed program director convey the forum's appreciation to our president who also came and also supported us on the first day and gracing our platform. I want to thank you again, Adia, for letting us host. It was a great opportunity and a privilege for us. We also, I think it was a pity that because of time and the pressures that um, most of your participants are under, we are unable to take you out of this hall to go and see our country, a beautiful country, which we pride ourselves, the beautiful people of South Africa, warm and friendly, and we're inviting you individually and in groups to visit our shores, and at least this time have more time to go and see where our people live and see them outside these halls. Uh, so we will welcome us of, of, all of, of all of you. So I say all of you as individuals, we're inviting you back to our country. We can tell you it's, it's beautiful, it's safe, people are friendly. But please travel safely and all of the best to Adia for the programs and the future programs. But thank you again, Adia. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, that ends the list of the speakers. Uh, We've really tried to be exemplary.
As I said on the first day, schools are incubators of future citizenry. So these young people have to be prepared for the future. Um, I want to, on behalf of the Executive Secretary of ADEA, to humbly request the following ministers to remain as soon as we are done with the two national anthems just for a few minutes. I can assure you just that it's going to be just for a few minutes. The Honorable Minister of Malawi, DRC, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Gabon, and Ghana, would, and Angola. Would you please remain after the session uh, is closed? I now want to humbly request uh, the audience to join us in singing the national anthems. Choir. <laughs> 